assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class this is your american literature class we've discussed a number of things um, in this uh, class uh, but what we're going to do today is going to be slightly different um, we started off this module with uh, Emerson's essay on self-reliance we went on to a couple of short stories we did a chapter from a novel if you remember um, the adventures of Tom Sawyer um, we also did uh, poems by Emily Dickinson T.S. Eliot um, Robert Frost and a couple of other poets and um, we, uh, we have moved on in time. Um, we started off with different movements. Um, and if you remember uh, when we were doing uh, the, um, the short story by Zora Neale Hurston, I told you that this was um, a representative of um, the Harlem Renaissance. So um, through time, we moved and um, we discussed and studied um, different genres in American literature. My aim throughout has been to introduce you to as many different aspects of um, American literature as it is possible for us to within the span of um, these 32 lectures. So I hope that I have been successful so far um, in um, allowing you to get a taste of American literature. You will see um, when you compare it with British literature, which you've been studying in um, the last three semesters, um, you will see that there are certain differences. Um, you will have noticed when we were doing poetry, for example, that the poetry of the 20th century um, U.S. is different from the poetry of other parts of the world, for example, because um, there is um, no longer that focus on rhyme and meter, and most of it is uh, blank verse or free verse. In the same way, um, you see that um, the short stories that we did, the plots, the themes were such um, that they represented the times in which they were being created. Um, there is no going back in the past. For example, the chapter that we did from um, the adventures of Tom Sawyer, it showed Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer uh, as they were at the time that the writer was um, writing that novel. Um, and uh, whatever Mark Twain, for example, was writing about was not about a time in the past. It was what was happening in contemporary American society at that point in time. And so he writes about um, things that he is most familiar with. For one thing, um, American literature focuses on the issues of the common man, the ordinary man in the street. Um, you do not have, let's say, stories of kings and queens or princes or fairies and witches and monsters. You have something that is very down to earth, something that represents life in the United States at the time um, in which that text is being created. So um, the same you find in poetry um, that you, you see that uh, in, for example, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, T.S. Eliot is writing about the dilemma of modern man, of the confusion and chaos in the mind of the modern man. Um, he's telling you about the superficiality of the women. Um, and, uh, and so we have moved on through time and different genres to reach a point in time where we are in the 20th century 
and what we are going to be doing today uh, and in the days to come is um, a play by uh, the playwright Tennessee Williams um, uh, and this play is titled The Glass Menagerie. Um, a menagerie you know is a place where you um, collect birds and animals. Now the glass menagerie is um, is a play that can be read on many different levels. Tennessee Williams um, is a prolific uh, dramatist. He has written many dramas and he's one of those dramatists who saw his plays being performed on stage and not just in one place but in a number of places. So while he was writing his plays, he um, was also a witness to those plays being staged or being performed in theaters across the United States and sometimes even in Europe. So Tennessee Williams is one of um, the contemporary dramatists. Some of his plays are based on um, short stories that he had written earlier and um, in that case he himself has adapted um, a play from a short story. A short story was successful, there was material um, that could be dramatized and so he converted it into um, a full-fledged drama. The Glass Menagerie is a play written by Tennessee Williams um, which can be read on more than one level. But when we are reading this play, then you will be able to see uh, what Tennessee Williams has tried to portray in this drama and you will also be able to judge how far he has been successful in port portraying um, the conditions of contemporary society in his play. So let's start with the text of the play and as I read out the text to you, I'm going to give you the explanation um, and um, we will see where we have points that need a lot of explanation and where we can just sort of skim through um, the text. Tennessee Williams, like I just told you, is um, one of those uh, playwrights who lived to see his plays being performed and that is one reason why he gives um, very detailed instructions. Um, his sets are um, given to you with detailed instructions. The props that are used um, have a lot of detail. Uh, and um, the instructions to the director and uh, actors uh, are very comprehensive. So let's start uh, with the text of The Glass Menagerie and uh, of course we're going to start with uh, the stage directions. The Wingfield apartment is in the rear of the building, one of those vast hive-like conglomerations of cellular living units that flower as warty growths in overcrowded urban centers of lower middle class population and are symptomatic of the impulse of this largest and fundamentally enslaved section of American society to avoid fluidity and differentiation and to exist and function as one interfused mass of automatism. Okay, now this is the first section of um, the introduction. Uh, the play revolves around three members of the Wingfield family. Um, the brother and sister and the mother. The father is not physically present but he has a presence in the play in the sense that there is this portrait that hangs and when we are doing um, the, the instructions in detail you will see, see that. There is a portrait that hangs on a wall 
and that is of the father and then there is mention of the father again and again to reinforce the fact that somewhere the father does exist so uh, back to um, the uh, introduction of um, the play uh, this is, the play takes place in uh, an apartment and this apartment um, Tennessee Williams very clearly states is not one of those richy rich apartments this is an apartment in a lower middle class residential area which means um, that they are just one step above being poor they call themselves middle class but they're actually the lower middle class and there's a very fine line between the lower middle class and the poor section of um, a society so the Wingfield apartment is in the rear of the building now um, if you have any idea of apartment buildings you will know that um, the price or the rent of uh, an apartment depends upon its location the physical location of the building and then within the building the location of the apartment if it if it faces front and has a good view um, then it's going to be more expensive if it faces the rear then it will be cheaper so in other words you are paying for the view also in a building there will be um, smaller apartments and big apartments um, and um, the smaller apartments will uh, definitely be sort of carved out of the bigger apartments um, the Wingfield apartment where uh, Mrs. Wingfield and her two children um, reside is definitely not one of the richer uh, apartments for one thing it's in the rear of the building and the building itself is like those huge boxes um, in which you can see tiny uh, windows or tiny doors they are living units uh, but they are living units uh, which are cheap and therefore not very comfortable uh, not in good safe locations uh, but these buildings are necessary uh, for uh, the development of the urban areas because you need labor that is cheap you don't want um, to have people coming in and saying you know we can't find a place to live in for example a city like um, Islamabad um, there are a lot of people who cannot afford the rents in Islamabad and therefore would live in Pindi and commute from Pindi to Islamabad the same is true of many other uh, big cities for example in Karachi you have um, you have offices in defense for example but those people who work in uh, defense um, may not necessarily be living in defense they may be living in um, in a far off place um, and commuting from there they may be living in um, let's say a place like what uh, Malir for example or um, or, or, or Kati Pahari or you know so many other places so um, the, the, the thing is that um, the location of an apartment um, decides the rent of um, the apartment or the price of the apartment so in this case this apartment building is like uh, hundreds of other apartment buildings and they are like ugly sores you know um, they do not contribute to the beauty of a city they are in the city they are in the urban centers um, and they are essential <clears throat> but they're not beautiful far from being beautiful they are like ugly warts you know like you have on uh, sometimes on your face and you want to get rid of it um, but you can't 
So um, the same is the case um, here in this play. Now the interesting thing is um, the words that Williams uses to describe um, different objects or different characters. So he calls it um, an overcrowded urban center of lower middle class population. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about um, the largest and fundamentally enslaved section of American society. Slavery went out, out with the Emancipation Proclamation, but um, this section of society, this section of the community, uh, Williams refers to as uh, fundamentally enslaved because there, they, there may not be physical bonds, there may not be um, physical chains, but it's fundamentally enslaved. That is, they are driven by desires and uh, by a mindset that is enslaved. Enslaved on many different levels. Enslaved because there is no money. Enslaved because um, there is no um, social position. Enslaved because there is no um, sound uh, educational background and therefore you suffer. You suffer the same as if you were tied with chains. So um, Williams calls it a fundamentally enslaved section of American society. And it and this entire mass, this entire volume of people exists as an interfused mass. They are totally dependent on one another. They cannot exist in isolation. One section of um, the society definitely needs the other section um, to survive um, singly or on their own. These different sections cannot survive. The apartment faces an alley and is entered by a fire escape. Hmm. How can you have an apartment entered by a fire escape? You know, you don't have a main door. Well, it is possible because this kind of an apartment would be very cheap because this is made in a place where you do not have um, direct entrance into the apartment building. So, People who live in the apartment building do not realize that there are poor people living with them just one wall away. So there are no direct entrances or exits into um, the center of the apartment building. So this fire escape is very important. It plays a central role um, in this play. Um, the fire escape is included in the set, that is the landing of it, and steps descending from it. So that's part of the set, um, and, and it's a very important part of the set. The scene is memory and is therefore non-realistic. So from the word go, Tennessee Williams is telling you that this is all memory, and because it is memory, it does not have to be realistic. So whatever he's going to show us um, is the production of his imagination. So um, since this is memory, um, there's a lot of exaggeration. As uh, Williams himself says, memory takes a lot of poetic license. It omits some details, Others are exaggerated according to the emotional value of the article it touches for memory is seated predominantly in the heart. The interior is therefore rather dim and poetic. Now the interior is that of the apartment. The interior of the apartment is dim, it is um, poetic um, and that allows uh, the imagination to work further because it is all memory. Um, therefore, some aspects are highlighted, exaggerated, others can be um, deleted or sort of glossed over 
so that um, you don't um, really uh, try to find out what is real and what is not. So the scene is memory and therefore non-realistic. Do not try to point out or to detect um, places or objects uh, which should not be there. Because from the, from the start of the play, Williams tells you that this play is memory. The scene is memory and it does not have to be realistic. There's a lot of poetic license, there's a lot of uh, license that um, the playwright has taken and which allows him to work around with the set uh, as well as with the different characters. At the rise of the curtain, the audience is faced with the dark, grim rear wall of the Wingfield tenement. This building, which runs parallel to the footlights, is flanked on both sides by dark, narrow alleys, which run into murky canyons of tangled clotheslines, garbage cans, and the sinister latticework of neighboring fire escapes. It is up and down these alleys that exterior entrances and exits are made during the play. At the end of Tom's opening commentary, the dark tenement wall slowly reveals by means of a transparency the interior of the ground floor Wingfield apartment. So, um, the entrance is through the fire escape and what Williams is trying to do here is to explain the set to you. When the curtain rises, what the audience sees is the dark, grim rear wall of the Wingfield tenement. So there is no bright light, um, there is no beauty that Williams is showing here. He's showing reality uh, with a touch of imagination. Uh, and so what he shows you is a wall which has nothing positive about it. Um, and the, um, the, the interior that is shown of the Wingfield apartment is not the interior of um, a well-furnished apartment, is not the interior uh, of an apartment that somebody would be proud to own or proud to live in. Um, this darkness uh, that um, you see on the stage, uh, and this is the darkness of not just poverty, uh, and imagination, but it is also the darkness of confusion, of uncertainty. Um, and so the entire set that Williams describes to you does not really attract you. You know, it's, it's not the kind of place that you would like to go to. It's just the kind of place that is shown to you in this play. Um, and it's the, the fire escapes, like I told you before, have a very important role to play because it is um, the means of entrance and exit from um, the, 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 the Wingfield apartment. Ordinarily, you would have a door opening out into a corridor, let's say, or perhaps a lobby area. But you don't have any such thing um, here because you've already been told in the very introductory paragraph um, that uh, the Wingfield apartment is not in the posh area. Um, it's, it's the lower middle class which is just one step above from um, the poor um, class. So um, Tom, who is a character in the play as well as the narrator, he makes his uh, entrance on the fire escape and at the end, towards the end of his speech, what we see is um, that the dark wall that we have been um, seeing since the beginning of the play uh, reveals the interior of um, the apartment 
and uh, this is done by means of a transparency or a slide so in other words that's not actually the apartment but it is an image of the apartment so let's go on and see what else Williams has to tell us so he's still continuing with the instructions and with um, the description of the stage and he says downstage is the living room which also serves as a sleeping room for Laura uh, the sofa unfolds to make a bed so they don't have you know dozens of uh, bedrooms they don't even have um, let's say um, four, three or four bedrooms so um, she sleeps in the living room which you would call the sitting room which you can also call the lounge um, and uh, she sleeps on the sofa you know you have these sofa beds um, at night you open it out and it becomes a bed and um, in the morning uh, you fold it up and it becomes a sofa and you can sit on it so um, there, there are arches and there are um, transparent uh, curtains which hide and also reveal different sections of um, the apartment. There is a dining room uh, and um, there's a sort of uh, glass case. Uh, Williams calls it a whatnot. You know, for want of a better word, um, it's called a whatnot. And in this, um, you can see a whole lot of glass animals, transparent glass animals. And that is your glass menagerie. A blown up photograph of the father hangs in the wall of the living room facing the audience to the left of the archway so, so very detailed directions um, uh, Williams is giving it is the face of a very handsome young man in a doughboy's first world war cap he's gallantly smiling ineluctably smiling as if to say I will be smiling forever like I told you before the father plays a very important role in the play in spite of the fact that he does not have a physical presence yet his portrait is there and he's there in the minds of um, the different characters particularly um, that of his wife the audience hears and sees the opening scene in the dining room through both the transparent fourth wall of the building and the transparent gauze curtains of the dining room arch. So um, Williams gives very detailed um, directions, very detailed instructions um, and he tells you um, which of um, the sections of the stage set can be moved and which are um, fixed permanent the narrator is an undisguised convention of the play he takes whatever license with dramatic convention is convenient to his purpose so in other words what Williams is doing is he's giving a lot of power um, into the hands of the director he has written the text he has written the play but within that play there's a lot of room to maneuver and when he says that the narrator takes whatever license he wants to um, he's giving that power not so much to the narrator as um, to the director of the play so Tom dresses uh, and makes his first appearances as a merchant sailor from Alley stage left and strolls across the front of the stage to the fire escape there he stops and lights a cigarette he addresses the audience remember what he uh, said in the very beginning about this being a memory play you have to remember that so um, Tom is dressed as uh, a merchant sailor uh, he's smoking a cigarette and um, he addresses the audience and how does he address the audience yes I have tricks in my pocket I have things up my sleeve but I am the opposite of a stage magician he gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth 
I give you truth in the pre pleasant illusion of, in the pleasant disguise of illusion. So Tom is the narrator of the play and Tom is going to go back into his memory to tell you what happened on um, a certain particular day, for example. So um, he says, I'm not like the magician who um, produces um, illusions and makes you think that this is reality. I take um, the truth and I give it to you as an illusion. Let's see how he does it. To begin with, I turn back time. So um, he says, I work with truth and I work with illusions. And um, to begin with, he says, I turn back time. Now, again, you have to remember that this is a memory play. So turning back time would be going down uh, memory lane and recalling certain in incidents, certain events, um, certain characters, etc., etc. I reverse it to that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of America was matriculating in a school for the blind. So very, very harsh um, satire on the part of Tennessee Williams. He talks about the 30s and um, uh, you will be familiar with the fact that in the 1930s America um, went through uh, one of its worst periods of recession. It's called the, um, the age of uh, depression. Um, or the era of depression uh, or the Great Depression because um, the market crashed and uh, people who were millionaires overnight became paupers. Um, and um, this is a very dark period in American history. So Williams sort of quotes everything in sugar and um, he talks about the middle class of America matriculating in a school for the blind. So according to Williams, um, the majority of Americans were deaf and blind. Um, and then he takes this image further um, to say that their eyes had failed them or they had failed their eyes. And so they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down on the fiery braille alphabet of a dissolving economy. So the entire image that he presents is that of a blind man who is forced to read um, through the use of Braille. You know what Braille is? Um, if you have seen a person without sight trying to read, uh, Braille is the uh, method by which you make um, tiny holes in the paper and um, once you move your um, the, the tips of your fingers on those holes you can make out what letters and what words have been written. So um, this was a method which um, was very much in vogue in the times of Tennessee Williams. Of course now it has been replaced like everything else by computers. Uh, and so you have software, you have programs um, which you can download and install and which will um, take dictation which will read out what you have um, written or what you have uh, dictated. Um, and, uh, and so this was um, the time when everything had to be done manually. And according to him, um, the uh, major section of American society uh, had gone blind. It didn't know where it was. It didn't know what to do, etc., uh, etc. Et In Spain, there was a revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion. In Spain, there was Gurnica. Here, there were disturbances of labor, sometimes pretty violent. In otherwise peaceful cities, 
such as Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis. This is the background of the play. Now you have to remember that um, Tom, in going down memory lane, is recalling the past. Um, he is a merchant sailor and he has um, sailed to different parts of the world. So when he um, starts talking about um, the blindness of American society, he also makes a comparison of what was happening in the United States with what was happening in Europe. So he says in Spain there was revolution, in the United States there was only chaos and confusion, there was shouting. In Spain, um, Pablo Picasso had painted um, the Guernica. Here, uh, the, the laborers were rising, they were demanding their rights. Uh, and some of these um, protests became violent. Uh, people were killed, people were injured. And all this was happening in cities which up to that point had been very peaceful. And he names um, three cities. He names Chicago, he, she, he names Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and um, St. Louis. And he says that the social background of the play is the age of depression, is poverty, um, is willful blindness, um, and cannot be compared with any other place. He has tried comparing it with Europe, but he finds that things in Europe were very uh, much settled. Um, whereas in the United States, there was chaos, there was shouting, confusion, People were demanding their rights. The government would not give them rights, etc., etc. So people were being thrown in jail. Um, people were being um, beaten up. Uh, and um, there was a lot of um, chaos and confusion in the streets. So this whole thing, the Depression era, um, the poverty, um, the violence, war, Everything uh, forms the social background of the play. The play is memory. There's music. Being a memory play, it is dimly lighted, it is sentimental, it is not realistic. This is something that um, Williams has already warned you about. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. And that is why in the wings you can see a fiddle or a violin. I am the narrator of the play. I am Tom. I am the narrator of the play. And I am also a character in this. The other characters are my mother Amanda, my sister Laura, and a gentleman caller who appears in the final scenes. So um, Tom starts off and he says that I am the narrator of the play um, and I am also a character. So because he is looking back over time because he is uh, traveling down memory lane. So he sees himself and um, he also sees his mother and um, his sister Laura. And there's a fourth character who appears and that is a gentleman caller. Now before we go on, I'd like to explain to you what exactly is a gentleman caller. Um, we have the equivalent of a gentleman caller here um, and that is uh, a rishta. You know what happens when a girl reaches a certain age? Um, there are people who are interested in marrying the girl and so um, they come with proposals. Now, in Western society, and particularly um, the time that um, Tennessee Williams is writing about, um, this was done in a different way. And what would happen is that when a girl reached a certain age, um, young men who wanted to get married would come to the girl's house and um, and see her and uh, try to establish communication with her and gauge whether she would be 
a good addition or an appropriate addition to their family. It wasn't the mothers and the sisters going out. It was the young men themselves going out. And so you have the concept of the gentleman caller being um, developed. Um, so all those gentlemen who were not blood relatives uh, because the West frowns on, uh, on cousin marriages or marriages within the family. So uh, people from that area, people, uh, young men who were uh, perhaps sons of friends would come and pay their respects at a particular time um, during the afternoon. In fact, the time between afternoon and evening was the time that was reserved um, for these things. So Tom says that he is the narrator of the play and he's also a character in the play. He is the most realistic character in the play, being an emissary from a world of reality that we were somehow set apart from. So he comes from the real world and he takes a trip down memory lane. Since I have a poet's weakness for symbols, he is the long delayed but always expected something that we live for. So Tom is uh, the equivalent of what do you have in our films? Um, the child who gets lost in the very beginning of the play and then he grows up and he discovers that he has family and then there is this grand reunion okay um, the difference is that um, here Tom is the emissary from the real world and he is coming into this world of illusion okay he is not actually coming because this is a trip down memory lane therefore Williams can play around with the text can do whatever he wants to with the characters and with the text so he says there's a fifth character in the play who doesn't uh, appear except in this larger than life-size portrait over the mantle okay so very important place uh, occupied by the portrait the father is there it's a large portrait it dominates the wall and the thought of the father dominates um, his children and um, his wife and so Tom says this is our father who left us a long time ago he was a telephone man who fell in love with long distances he gave up his job with the telephone company and skipped the light fantastic out of town the last we heard of him was a picture from um, was a picture postcard from Mazatlan on the Pacific coast of Mexico containing a message of two words hello goodbye and no address so this is where you're introduced to the fifth character remember Tom um, Laura the mother uh, Mrs. Wingfield, the gentleman caller and the fifth character. The fifth character is very important because he doesn't make a physical appearance but um, the impression is always there that he is a very important character. Whatever they say, whatever they do, at the back of all their speech and actions is the presence of Mr. Wingfield. Um, and on stage his presence is shown by this large photograph that um, hangs on one of the walls um, and Tom explains um, his father's disappearance by saying that he worked for the telephone company uh, but he wanted to wander he he had this urge to wander throughout the world to travel throughout the world and therefore one fine day he just left without informing anyone without um, asking anyone whether he should go or 
uh, whether he was needed um, in this household. So um, he just sort of upped and left. As he says, he skipped the light fantastic out of town. The light fantastic, you know, is a reference to, do uh, to, to dancing. So he just danced out of town. Um, and uh, the last, he says, that we heard of him, he was on the, the Pacific coast of Mexico. And there was just this one picture postcard that he sent. After years and years of disappearance, he sends this picture postcard and there are two words on it. Hello, goodbye. And there's no address. So there was no way that they could um, trace him. There's no way that, he, uh, that they could sort of um, bring him back because he didn't want to come back. If he had wanted to come back, if he had wanted them to communicate with him, he would have provided a return address. But he does not. All that he does do um, is that he sends a postcard saying, I am alive. So the hello and goodbye, in other words, uh, are announcements that um, he's alive. I think the rest of the play will explain itself. Okay, so Amanda's voice becomes audible through the curtains and the legend on screen. Now you have this screen which uh, shows you the legend or which uh, gives you clues as to what is going to happen or uh, what is happening. So the legend on the screen um, translated from uh, French say, where are the snows of yesteryear? Um, and Amanda, uh, when she makes her entrance, this is a very um, appropriate um, legend for Amanda because Amanda lives in the past. She cannot uh, bear to live in the present. Um, she's obsessed with the past because whatever she had as a young girl, she does not have anymore. What she does have is two grown-up children and she can't seem um, to decide what is going to happen to those children and uh, what is she to do about these children. So um, this legend on the screen uh, is a specialization of uh, Tennessee Williams. And um, the fact that he places where are the snows of yesteryear um, right at the moment when uh, Amanda, uh, Amanda's voice is heard uh, tells you that this is something that applies to Amanda's character. Um, Tom divides the curtains and uh, enters the upstage area. Amanda and Laura are seated at a drop leaf table. You know what a drop leaf table is like? A table that can be extended. You have maybe uh, a rectangular table and on the sides you have uh, semicircles uh, attached to the main table. They can drop down and the table will become a rectangle. Um, they can be raised up and you will be able to seat um, two or three people uh, on each side. So it's a drop leaf table and they indicate that they are eating. Um, remember what he said before? There's a lot of poetic license here. Uh, and it doesn't have to be realistic. You don't have to actually put fruit there or soup or tea um, or roti and salan or, uh, or, or other things. So um, there are no utensils, there's no food and yet Amanda and Laura are making the motions of eating. You know how you do it when you're a child? You have a party, children have little parties um, and you say, okay, we will, today we will cook such and such a thing. And so you call people over and you say, okay, here's your tea. And um, the, the child that you invite as guest will move, make as if he's picking up the cup and drink the tea and then say, oh, you make such delicious tea. Actually, um, nothing of the sort is happening. There's no tea, there's no utensils. 
that's the kind of situation you find with Amanda and Laura here Amanda faces the audience um, Tom and Laura uh, are seated in profile so you can see them from the side but you cannot um, see their faces the interior has been lit up softly and through the screen we see Amanda and Laura seated at the table in the upstage area so Amanda and Laura are seated at the table and they make um, gestures and they make motions as if they're eating um, Amanda faces the audience Tom and Laura are um, seated on opposite sides and you can only see them in profile the interior lights up very softly and through the screen we see Amanda and Laura seated at the table um, so Amanda calls out to Tom and Tom says yes mother Amanda says we can't say grace till you come to the table and Tom says coming mother he bows slightly and withdraws uh, remember he is um, on the landing of the fire escape as a narrator but when um, the scene opens um, and uh, Amanda calls out to him Tom comes down the stairs uh, and he uh, goes and um, sits at the table um, the the fact that um, that Amanda makes a reference to grace uh, to saying grace is rather ironic because there's no food that can be seen and saying grace is a Christian um, convention or a Christian tradition um, which is usually done when meat is served at the table um, and a special blessing or a prayer is invoked um, that the the household and uh, the different people living in the house might be blessed the food that they are eating uh, might be blessed and everything be okay um, for the family and with the family so the fact that Amanda um, calls Tom to um, to join in the meal is ironic because you don't see any food you don't see any utensils and yet she asks him to come because um, she says we cannot start without you so Tom um, says he's coming and then he bows slightly to the audience and he appears uh, with Amanda and um, his sister Laura so Amanda says uh, don't push with your fingers now all this is uh, is play acting there's no food there are no utensils uh, but um, Tom Amanda and Laura make motions as if they're actually eating so when Amanda says honey don't push with your fingers um, she's refer she's trying to uh, authenticate the entire setting she's trying to show that um, there is actually food on the table that they are actually eating out of utensils so she, she says don't push your food around if you have to push with something the thing to push with is a crust of bread and chew chew animals have sections in their stomachs which enable them to digest food without mastication but human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down so this kind of um, this kind of a conversation is not normally done at the dining table and it's not very polite to talk about what happens to the food when it goes inside your stomach um, but uh, that's what Amanda is like uh, when she sees uh, that her son is sort of gobbling the food down he says you know take it easy you'll have to learn to take things easy you have to chew your food because we are human um, and the process of our digestion although um, it, um, it, it begins um, late it's a very comprehensive uh, manner of digestion and it's not like animals um, who can swallow things and have their intestines and their stomach process the food 
So he says human beings must chew, they must learn to chew. You know, um, doctors say that you should chew everything 32 times, you try doing that and you'll find out how long it takes to eat your food. So she is um, sort of uh, constantly at Tom uh, and she says you must chew your food because you're a human being and you must show um, that you are um, different from uh, other people. Now, um, we're going to pause here um, and um, just quickly recap what we have um, done today. And uh, what we have done uh, is started this new play, uh, which is a very famous play by Tennessee Williams. It's titled The Glass Menagerie. Um, it is a memory play as um, Tennessee Williams uh, claims again and again and therefore he says um, that I do not make um, any claims that this is about real life or that whatever is happening within the play um, is a reflection of reality because this is a memory play and in a memory play you can add, delete, wh whatever and uh, however you want to. So um, the fact that it is a memory play is shown in many different ways. The apartment building um, in which the Wingfields live is in the very um, lower middle class section. It's in, a, it's in an area which is already um, overpopulated where you have these tenement buildings, these boxes glowing, going up um, and um, the location of the Wingfield apartment is such that it faces um, the fire escapes. It does not have a view of um, anything that you would like to, um, to see or appreciate. Um, it's all very dull and dreary and grimy, so that means that it's dirty also. Um, that's the exterior of the building. The interior, that is the Wingfield apartment, um, uh, Tennessee Williams has explained in a lot of um, detail. And um, a few of the things that he talks about is uh, one, that um, there's a big portrait on one of the walls and that portrait you assume is that of Mr. Wingfield. Um, apart from that there is this um, glass, uh, what do you call it, showcase type of thing, cabinet in which there are a lot of um, small glass animals. And it's these animals that give this um, drama the title of the glass menagerie. Um, the characters who are involved in the action that takes place here are Amanda Wingfield, uh, Tom Wingfield, Laura Wingfield. These are the three main characters. Um, and then there's a fourth character which appears in the very last scenes and that's the, the gentleman caller. There's a fifth character that Williams explains but that character is only present by his absence and that is this portrait that is hanging on the wall um, is that of um, Amanda's husband, Mr. Wingfield. Uh, and the father of um, the two children, um, Laura and Tom. Um, so the, the presence of the father is very strong. It's very important because uh, whatever they are talking about um, has the presence or absence of the father as a kind of catalyst. Um, so when the curtain rises, we see Tom standing on the fire escape, um, delivering his, um, his, his narration. And he, while he's doing that, he admits that he is not only the narrator, but he's also a character in the play. And so uh, when the stage lights up and we see uh, Mrs. Wingfield sitting at um, the what you would call the dining table, 
uh, with Laura. She calls out to Tom. Now Tom, who has been acting as the narrator in the play, descends the fire case and um, comes to uh, the, the dining room where uh, Mrs. Wingfield and Laura are already seated. And Mrs. Wingfield says, we can't say grace until you come to the table. We cannot thank the Lord unless you come to the table. So um, all the while there's no food and it's only through gestures that um, they try to show um, that Amanda and uh, Laura are actually eating. Uh, when Amanda's voice is first he heard, um, the legend on the screen um, gives the hint, the snows of yesteryear. And that is a very um, apt um, remark uh, for, uh, for Amanda because Amanda definitely lives in the past. She lives in um, the time when she was young and she was pretty. Uh, and she was very much in demand. So the snows of yesteryear uh, are a reference to the fact that um, although Amanda's pa uh, time is past, she still brings it up again and again. She's got young children um, who are old enough to get married, but she still thinks of the time when she was not married. Um, and so um, when, uh, when we come towards the end of this section of the play, uh, Amanda, in order to establish um, the validity of the food that they're supposed to be having, uh, tells Tom not to push his uh, food around with his, um, with his fingers. Um, and she's sort of training him uh, even now to be, um, to be a good man. Uh, and she says, don't push your food around. You know, only little children or animals do that. And you're grown up. So um, you need to be very careful about um, what, you, um, what, what you take. And um, at the same time, Amanda also emphasizes to, um, to Tom to chew. Now, this is something that, um, that shows us that Amanda is trying to uh, authenticate um, Tom's eating gestures. Remember, there's no food. There are no utensils. Uh, but Amanda wants him to join in the action also. So he has to uh, come off the, um, the, the fire escape and um, join them at the table. And when he does, she starts criticizing whatever it is um, that he's doing. If, if he's eating, she'll tell him uh, not to do it in that way and to do it um, in a particular manner, etc., etc. And one of the things that she uh, focuses on is um, the process of uh, mastication. And she says, you must chew your food. Don't swallow it. Only animals do it. So th there's a, um, a certain um, snob element that you detect in Amanda's speech at this um, point in time. Uh, when she says that, you know, human beings have, um, have uh, a different system from animals. Animals can gulp down their food and their stomach will break it up into different enzymes. But that's not the case with human beings. Human beings need to start early because um, it's only when you chew your food properly um, that you... Um, that you digest it. But um, if you just uh, swallow food, then your um, stomach will not be able to, um, to tear it down into um, enzymes and uh, provide energy um, for, uh, for the body. So that, that's enough for today. Uh, we'll meet again soon 
and we'll do some more of the glass menagerie. So thank you very much and Allah Hafiz.